card in the late 60s here in California when B of A was the largest bank in the world but also only essentially a California bank because of the trust rules at that time, banking laws at that time. They decided that they wanted to extend the power of this bank card all over the world. And they did it by converting Bank AmeriCard into what we call today Visa, Visa International. They called together many banks from different countries, first in the US, and said, look, we've got a system for validation and verification so that customers, you can issue a, a credit card to your customer, they can go anywhere in the world. We've got 20,000 banks who are collaborating, even though many of them are direct competitors with each other. You can go into a merchant anywhere in the world, and he will recognize this card, and because of a validation system, you can have a tr an effective transaction. And that's what money does. It increases the trust. But the question before us is, now that with the world, with all this money, with 90, 80% of this money is not being used for the original intended purpose of stimulating economic welfare and economic well-being, 80% of it or more is circling around the world searching for speculative returns searching to make more money on the money rather than be used and extended to meet human needs. And of course, that's what's happening with the cryptocurrencies today also. In fact, much more so. Not 80%, but maybe 95 or 98%. Because very few of the cryptocurrencies so far are being used to really meet human needs. They're being used for speculation in the hope in the anticipation that this new technology is going to take off and maybe I can multiply my thousand dollars by a hundred or four hundred or four thousand times the way some of the early investors in Apple did. And what do we need for a system that would really channel money not towards speculation but towards channel money more effectively for meeting real human needs. So money is essentially a networking tool. In essence, it's no different than language. The value of our language is not that we know 100,000 words. The value of our language is that we all know the same words and that we can exchange information, we can communicate with each other because it's a networking tool to share. It doesn't matter how much I know, it matters how much we're interconnected with each other and the value of any language we speak. The, the advantage of being an American today or an Englishman today is you could go to a lot of countries and speak in your native language and be heard, uh, which is not true for many others. So it's a more effective networking tool. Its value is simply because it enables us to relate effectively. Imagine if only five or 10% of our communication could be effectively reach other people, what would be the waste? The rest, it would be a waste. If only one-tenth of what I say is intelligible to uh, an audience or to people we're communicating with, what would be the effective utility of the system we live in. And that's the problem with money today. We've got a lot of money with people who know all the language, and they are not able to effectively communicate to release the potentials, to tap the capacities of the rest of the society, either for their well-being or for the well-being of everybody else. And of course, the internet is the same thing. The power of the internet comes not because you or I have a computer that's linked to the internet, but because there are millions of computers, hundreds of millions, more than a billion computers linked to the internet, the more are in the, the, in the system, the more nodes there are, the more power comes to each of us. And that's the same principle with money.
A lot of people have trouble with money, uh, not only getting it, I mean, but uh, understanding it, because the original, still the conception is that money is a thing, that money is something you either have it or don't have it. When we start talking about money as trust, that's confusing because, well, trust is intangible. I'm, trust is nebulous. Trust is something we create through a psychological attitude, whereas money as a thing is something real and concrete. And of course, if you go back a few thousand years, it's true that our, we were using physical commodities as money. We were using cows. At the time of the American Revolution, we, were, we couldn't get enough currency because the British were preventing us from coining our own. We were using tobacco leaves and even beads, wampum beads. We needed something physical. But it's a long time. You know, in the late 19th century, there were 6,000 banks in the United States issuing their own money. We call it banknotes. The reason we, they were called banknotes is because any bank could issue its own money. And most of those banks, the money was valid and accepted over a short, in a small area. A few of the banks built up a reputation. So it was extended. If you were from a bank in New York City, for example, your currency may be extended over a long period of time. And it's only really in the 20th century that we've had national currencies prevalent as the model to build greater trust and credibility. Because if you take currency from a bank from Louisiana or Oregon or Montana or wherever it may be, how do you know the bank is even in business? How do you really know that they have any capacity to honor it? So we want something that's trustworthy. The question is, can we build a more trustworthy and effective monetary system than the one we have today? After World War II, when the Bretton Woods Conference was uh, conducted, two proposals were brought to that conference, one by UK, the other by the US, to establish a global currency. Why don't we establish a world currency so that we don't have to worry about this constant interchange between the national currencies and how to figure out the balance of payments and everything uh, like that? And uh, the British pushed the idea. There was interest from uh, the Americans. And finally, uh, somebody in the, in the White House figured out that a, you, the America has a unique opportunity now to be the essential currency of the world and enjoy a tremendous advantage over other countries by not having a world currency. And essentially, the US dollar has become a de facto world currency with enormous benefits to one country, but not to the world as a whole. Because the political decisions that are made as to how much money to generate and what that money is to be used for are made by a national government responsive to its own people, not to the world and to humanity as a whole. The value of a money, what is the value of the money? We think, oh, money is backed by gold. But I think we all know there's no gold standard anymore. What's not commonly known is that at the height of the gold standard, I'm talking at the late, the end of the 19th century, in Britain, which had the, 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 the British pound, pound sterling, was really considered the currency in the world. The gold reserves in the Bank of England were equal to only 5% of the currency that was in circulation. That was enough to balance their trade relationships with other countries in case there was a deficit in, in one area or another. It never was the backing during the height of the gold standard. It was never the backing for the whole currency. The backing for the currency was the productivity of the country, the productivity of the people, the know-how, the capacity to take resources, the training and education of their people. In the middle of the Great Depression, when FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, became the president of the United States, he was right in the middle of a financial crisis, which 6,000 US banks had failed. 
and all the efforts of economists to stop the bank failures, to stop the bank panic, had failed. And he said nothing he had learned in economics at Harvard had prepared him to deal with this crisis. And he got on the radio, first of his famous fireside chats, and he said, look, what has happened to us? We're the same country that was the most prosperous country in the world. We have the same talented people, the same educated people, the same rich natural resources, the same factories and everything. What's different? The only thing we've lost is our confidence. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Famous words he said. And he got on the radio and he said, now Monday morning I'm gonna open the banks. Last week you were all lined up at the banks to withdraw your money before the banks failed because you had lost trust in the system on Monday when the banks open, I want you to go back to the banks and redeposit your money. What type of solution is this to tell people to go and risk everything by putting their life savings back in the bank? And he did other things. He introduced the deposit insurance and all, backed by the government guarantees. And within a week, the banking crisis, which has gone on for three years, which had taken a toll of 6,000 banks was reversed because he replaced fear with trust. So what I want you to think about, what we are trying to think about, what I think everybody in this industry, was, whether they're interested in cryptocurrency or not, should be thinking about is, how do we use this new technology to create a greater trust in a way to create liquidity, to tap the human potential and to meet the human needs we have. If you look at the figures, take one example, for example, education. According to UNESCO, if we want to meet the needs of all young people who are seeking higher education in the world, we would have to create a new Harvard University every day every day of the week for the next 20, 25 years. Harvard University, the size of Harvard University, now it's taken hundreds of years, centuries, to build one institution that ranks uh, pretty close to the top of Cambridge and Oxford or Harvard, Harvard and MIT or Stanford and so forth. How are you going to build one every day, every week, for the next 10, 20, 25 years? And even if you did that, would that really be what we need? Uh, is the knowledge that we need for the future really in our university system today? Or are we teaching our students today the knowledge accumulated from the past at a time when the world is changing so quickly that the idea that the, the, that the university is simply a place where we get information is no longer valid. It was valid in 1077 when the University of Bologna first started uh, the first university in Europe because at that time there were no books even. Books were written by hand, they were so valuable they were chained to the library shelves. And if you could find somebody who had information, he was next to a genius. And it made sense at that time, 400 years before the advent of the printing press, before the newspaper, let alone before the radio, the telegraph, the TV, and the internet. 400 years before that, it made sense for everybody to gather and listen to one person and take notes. The only problem is that all the psychological research shows that when we listen to somebody and we get information from them, the average retention rates over time is only about 5%. It's a very, very inefficient method of transferring knowledge. And transfer of knowledge is not enough for us today because the knowledge of the past doesn't work. The knowledge that I studied 50 years ago in the university, uh, the knowledge that uh, many of you studied 10 or 15 years ago or five years ago or three years ago is not the knowledge 
that's going to prepare us for the future. And this is a challenge everywhere in the world that our whole educational system has to shift from giving information which we can get from other sources to really helping people learn how to learn, how to think, how to think out of the box, how to think creatively as you are doing, as we are trying to do collectively in meetings like this. We're not here to, to give a gospel of the future because nobody, nobody can see it. We're here to think out of the box and ask ourselves, what can we do with this that we're not doing today? How can the world be different than it is today? What does that have to do with blockchain? Today, our, you know, in the US, I'm sure many of you know, and some of you may be victims of it, the largest single source of private personal debt is educational loans, more than a trillion dollars. Do you mean to say young Americans are invested, gone deep into debt for more than a trillion dollars to learn a knowledge of the past, which is, listen to what the studies by McKinsey and others tell us, the knowledge of the past is not going to work in the future. The jobs of the past, the jobs of today won't be here in 10, 15 years. Is that where we should be spending our money? Imagine if we had a currency that could be used for real investment in the future where we could use that money to tap the potential. Think about the potential of the people in this room, for example. What is the knowledge you have? What is the experience you have? A very diversified experience, which is not getting into the educational system, which is not accessible to anybody else. Can we think of creating a currency that would enable, would create additional liquidity so that we could tap that human resource, whether it's retired teachers or people out in business or earlier generation or whatever it may be, we could create a system where that knowledge, that capabilities would be available to human beings all over the world. We have the technology for it now, not just blockchain. We have the technology to deliver knowledge over the world, but we don't have a monetary system to support that. What's wrong with our monetary system? Well, there are many limitations to it. One of them is, the high cost of transactions, especially when you go internationally. If you take a simple thing like credit card transactions or yeah. typical international business money flows, the average cost of a transaction for changing the currency is something like five to seven percent. In a cryptocurrency, it ranges from maybe a tenth of a percent up to one percent. I showed you that figure of $3 trillion that we're spending now. And obviously, it's going to go up because the amount of international commerce and relations and interaction is going up so rapidly. Imagine if we can eliminate that $3 trillion and put it into real value added and value services. And even for that $3 trillion, the typical transaction takes three days, five days, sometimes longer. Whereas uh, on blockchain, it could be almost instantaneous. So there are real needs that are not being met by a national monetary system where, because this is legal tender, only the dollar is legal tender here, or the franc, or the mark, or whatever, uh, the euro now, of course. Uh, uh, because of that, uh, we have to spend this extra money and extra time to communicate with each other, to trust each other. Imagine what would happen if we had, even in parallel to the national currencies, we had one, or even better than that, a, a polyculture of cryptocurrencies, which were interconvertible with each other, which did not require exchange into a national currency. It could be exchanged, but did not require that, uh, unless it was necessary. Think of the amount of facility we would have. Now, we need not, we can do many things with that. I have a colleague who spoke at the United Nations in Geneva last week about a program for financing the sustainable development goals by creating a cryptocurrency. 
I think most of you heard of the SDGs, 17 SDGs designed to meet humanity's needs for everything from food and housing to health care, education, and of course, addressing environmental needs, environmental challenges. Isn't it worth an investment? We invest in our physical infrastructure. Isn't it worth the world investing in a currency that could be spent only for activities that address these sustainable development goals all over the world. Even uh, Mrs. Lagarde, the managing director of IMF, has said a cryptocurrencies could have an enormous impact on greater inclusiveness because our economy today, the global economy today, is not inclusive. You don't need a bank account to, to receive or use cryptocurrencies. And there are a lot of people who don't have access to a bank account. You wouldn't have the costs involved in, in that structure. You could create money for specific socially beneficial reasons, purposes. Well, I've tried to throw, throw out uh, some ideas just to get beyond the horizon of what's happening with Bitcoin and Ethereum and the other currencies today. Because right now, um, cryptocurrencies are earning blockchain a bad name. They've, they've succeeded in one thing, and I give them credit for that, they've succeeded in attracting a lot of investment into blockchain. Uh, and that's a benefit because we need that investment. We need the kind of research and efforts that are being done by people who are here and others around the world to develop this platform. But the, the purpose of this, ultimately, this is not what's going to be there 10, 20, 30 years from now. When the dot-com boom ends, and the bubble ends, rather, we're gonna be there with those who can really meet human needs. And that's the question I think we should all be asking ourselves. How can we not put our money on the right uh, uh, bet, but how can we create money that will really meet needs here and around the world in the future? I think there's a, a few minutes left, and I'd really encourage any comments or <coughs> questions that you have on anything I've said. Yes, please. So uh, what do you think of the role of crypto in private equity and uh, we talked about it being uh, used for our everyday life, but for businesses and private equity, you know, short term, what do you think the SEC is planning? Your speculations, of course, nobody knows what they're planning. Uh, I would go back to the principle that I've given, that if this is investment in a business idea that has potential, great. If this, if, I think that's great, but how much of its investment in a business opportunity and how much its investment, you know what happens before an IPO. Yeah. A lot of the investment has nothing to do with the business model. A lot of it has to do with the expectation uh, of the financial industry that, well, the value is gonna go up as soon as the IPO is run. And that draws money in, uh, that's part of the system, but that's not the part that really builds new businesses. So I think there's too much attention on the speculation about what's going to happen to the coin and not enough on the underlying business model. And that's detrimental because we need new business models. We need, I've had people call me and say, I've got a great idea. I'm going to have an ICO and we're going to make so much of money. I said, what's the business model? Oh, it's going to be an education. Great. What is the business model? Well, it's going to be a uh, but we'll figure, we're too busy now running and preparing for the IPO, we'll figure that out later. I think there's a lot of that going on. Fundamentally, this is, to me, this is really sound because we're gonna meet real needs and we can create a bridge to, 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 for trust where it doesn't exist in the society today. But too much of the energy is going to distraction. Thank you. Both Gary. Phenomenal. Thank you so much for what you did because uh, we've been in this for a long time and it's just I had this eye opener. It's, it's really fantastic. So thank you so much for being here.